We'll begin in Montpelier, where Governor Phil Scott released his budget recommendations this week, really only a starting point for the State House session ahead. He walked into the House chamber to a standing ovation. Members of the legislature, statewide officials, justices of the Supreme Court, and special guests. And in a 43-minute speech, he outlined his spending wishes for the year ahead. But it was soon clear many Democrats did not like what they heard. The governor would limit general fund spending increases to about 3.6 percent, which is all the new money, he said, that was coming in. Dead set against any new taxes or fees that might add to those lawmakers passed last year. All told, $8.6 billion in proposed spending across hundreds of different line items, starting with the new fiscal year in July. All right, let's bring in NBC5's Stephen Biddick. Stephen, you were at the Capitol for the address, and you heard the reaction. What'd you think? Yes, Stu, so a much tighter budget this year due to a lot of the federal COVID cash drying up along with recent state surpluses. This budget only jumping up in total about 2% from 8.4 billion last year to 8.6 billion this year as Scott does not want to raise any more taxes and fees. And to do that, you'd have to create new programs, which he does not want to do to raise the burden on Vermonters. But it was also interesting because members of his administration said afterwards, they just feel Democrats lacked respect for the governor. They said they weren't standing, they weren't class being in the pomp and circumstance ceremonial walking in walking out and citing back to his time in the senate saying no matter how mad the legislature may have been at former governor peter schumlin they would always stand and show their respect and feel that just lacked this year yeah it did seem i've seen a lot of them uh, did seem like the house in particular struggled to get to their feet 11 applause breaks by my account uh which seemed low the big scare in the building right now, though, for, for members of every party seems to be that 18 percent uh, property tax increase projected for the coming year to pay for uh, a huge spike in spending for public education. Let's listen to the governor now. Vermonters can't afford this increase. And when you consider it, it comes with stagnant or declining enrollment and troubling test scores, none of us should be OK with it. I truly believe if we'd acted on any of the proposals I put forward in 2017 or 18 or 19, we'd be better off today. As I said, I'm willing to discuss any of those past ideas, from right-sizing schools and classrooms to better, to better under addressing health care and retirement costs to property tax caps and adjustments or more. And maybe we need to revisit and undo some of the things we've done that added to school pressures or rethink the funding formula. But I'm not naive. Without a willing partner, I'm sure any proposal I put on the table will be used to drive divisive attacks and headline clicks and we won't get anything done. To be clear, I'm here, ready to work on these ideas, or any of yours, whenever you are. Yeah, a lot of Democrats didn't like the tone of that. Yes, Stu, they were very frustrated talking to Senate President Pro Tem Phil Baruth. He said they wanted a tangible plan for how to solve this potential property tax increase, and they just didn't hear it. He also said he doesn't believe it should have to be in the legislature's hands to figure this out, and saying at the end of the day, the governor has the power to put money where he wants in the budget, and by him not putting anything to potentially fix this property tax, they were just very frustrated because now they feel it's on their shoulders. But going back to some of Scott's points, he still feels that they have a supermajority, so even if you put some of those ideas out there, it's no guarantee they would take it up. Right, right. Another big theme uh, for the governor um, that shows up in the news a lot, uh, crime. Uh, he wants to undo some of the reforms that lawmakers have passed in recent years uh, and that he has signed, including raising the age at which uh, a youthful offender uh, could still be tried in family court, uh, and bail reform, a big one, to try to get at this catch and release uh, thing we seem to have uh, in our state, uh, the revolving door, some call it, at the courthouse. Uh, the governor said he's all for giving people a second, even a third chance, but he said uh, it's clearly not working. For example, in the matter of a year, 
Two murders in St. Johnsbury involved multiple people out on conditions of release. One of them had seven criminal charges pending, but they were all free and involved in these homicides. On at least four different occasions, a woman in Franklin County was arrested for narcotic sales and release on conditions. So instead of being jailed, she continued selling crack and fentanyl. A man in Rutland had 35, 35 criminal charges pending in state court and 18 earlier cases of failing to appear. He continued to roam free until he was picked up for stealing a firearm. All these policies were well-intentioned, but we must be honest. Some of the changes we made are harming our communities. And then just this week, a 23-year-old man stormed into a Burlington bar running from police and took two customers hostage. Negotiations went on for hours. One hostage, who happens to be an NBC5 employee, said she resorted to hitting the man over the head with a chair in order to permit her to escape after he, uh, she said, started to prepare Molotov cocktails during the standoff. Then police told us he'd had 100 previous interactions uh, with uh, that suspect who is now behind bars. Stephen, critics like the ACLU strongly uh, opposed uh, what they called Scott's get tough on crime agenda, noting that um, you know more people in prison means higher taxpayer costs. Yes, too, the ACLU is not happy with some of those plans that Governor Scott has. And there's a bit of a divide between lawmakers and people in the state house of kind of what to do going forward but sitting in on senate judiciary and house judiciary throughout the session the biggest ward of whether it's law enforcement states attorneys or even businesses all across the state is accountability and they're feeling these offenders are just not being held accountable and it's resorting to these increase in repeat offenders well uh drug prevention is is a, another big one uh means two different things to democrats and to the administration it seems the uh, legislature um, on track to pass that um, you know, harm reduction or uh, you know supervised injection site pilot project. As we said, the um, applause uh, in the room seemed fairly tepid, uh, but you spoke with a number of top Democrats afterwards, and let's play a little bit of what they had to say. I think it's great when you acknowledge if you thought that something that you did is a mistake. I think that we have a lot of work to do when it comes to public safety, but I think we have different visions of how to do that. I think put, you know, sending kids to jail <laughs> isn't going to solve our problems. We need to make investments in our justice system to really handle the backlog that we have. We know that that is a critical investment to help our public safety issues right now. We'll be looking at other policies, and I hope they'll join us in that conversation. What I will say is that I appreciated from the governor, there was a bipartisan thread through the, through the speech. So he talked about areas where we were in agreement. I was glad to see the five uh, million dollars in bridge funding for the state university. That's something he didn't include last year and he did this year. The other thing I would say is he used the phrase, I was wrong when it came to certain uh, criminal reform things that he signed. Some of those I worked on in judiciary, and I still believe in them, but the governor tends to believe with some people that things like raise the age are responsible for increased crime rates. I don't necessarily believe that myself. That's raise the age is just where you start, family court or, uh, or criminal court. So I don't believe it's contributed to a spike in crime. But again, I was glad to hear him shoulder some of the burden. We don't see that a lot from the administration. So in that way, it was kind of a mature speech. But then there was some of the old, um, you know, I will uh, let you come out with strategies on the tough things. So for instance, the 18% tax increase, he's just not going there except to say, uh, that people should vote their school budgets down. If they don't, it's on us. So uh, it's just a starting point, but it looks like a, the two sides are far apart as we begin this new session. Yes, Stu, I would say the line in the sand has been drawn a lot quicker than it was this time last year. NBC5's Stephen Biddick's uh, for us. Thanks very much. Thanks, Stu.